Busted or botched? How often do we think that when units come out? Now, I'm here with the Shadow to talk about the most controversial units in each generation. Whether they're so utterly busted that the meta had to warp around them, or the release was so bad that it left you wondering if anyone was in charge at IS. At the end, we're going to discuss whether controversy is good for the game or not, but let's get into it. Hello, summoners, and welcome to another episode of Phaeology, the study of Fire Emblem Heroes. I'm here with the Shadow, and this guy does everything. This is the de facto highlight video guru. He averages almost two videos per day for the last, what is it, two years now? And he's a game press editor. The Shadow, how are you? Hey man, thanks for the great introduction. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here. I'm doing pretty good. We're gonna talk about the most busted and botched units, and I thought we needed to go over the definition of these things just briefly. Now, when we talk about busted, these are meta-destroying units. We're talking units that completely negate past investments. Units that are so busted that they absolutely change the meta. When we talk about botched, we're talking about units that are mishandled or money grabbing or just flat out poorly designed. First up, we have the man himself, Reinhardt. Okay, this is a big question. Now we've both talked about the fact that at this time, neither of us were very competitive, but I wanna know, when did you first realize that Reinhardt was broken? Arena was always like that thing you'd see him in. But when he was paired with the likes of Brave Lynn, that's when it was like really in my <laughs> face. And the only thing I could really do at the time was probably just use Noe or like somebody else until I got like uh, a, a new counter because <laughs> you could not tank him. It was really difficult at the time. Okay, I had Raven Tome, Dancer, Inigo. Yeah, I, that's what I used too. That was such a meta build. <laughs> Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> it, it took care of both him and Brave Lynn, which was excellent. Now, on the busted chart, it's hard not to go five stars on this unit just because how good he was then and what a ripple effect he had. Even now, he's he's good. He's just not great. And this is, this is a Gen 1 unit that hasn't had a refine and is still relevant. That is nuts. Yeah, it's crazy to think about, too, because everything that's just keeping him more and more alive is less about, like, PRF skills and more of the inheritance that he can get. So, like, even when, like, CYL2 came around and we got, like, Deathblow 4, everyone was like, oh, Reinhardt's back. <laughs> <laughs> now, it is a known fact that after Reinhardt, IS nerfed Cavs so badly. Do you think that was needed? I honestly don't know if they were even needed to this point day, but I found them convenient, at least when I'm not using cabs. It's more so I think they kind of like put out a like relatively hot fix as quickly as they could without it being like completely game ruining. So they're like, okay, tiles that like negate or reduce the amount of movement cabs get, this will stop Reinhardt and it will also throw in like Sigurd and Bravike, you know, the ones that are like definitely meant to tank them. Yeah, I, I, I think they had Reinhardt on the mind for Probably that period of time. So basically, it was just a bit of an overreaction. <laughs> I would say so, yeah. Which is probably why he's still not getting a refund. Or they may give it. They may give him one in the future, but I don't think they really want to do anything with him anymore. That's a like <laughs> new variant. <laughs> but that leads us to a, a unit that was handled a little differently. This is Ira, and I always forget how shady <laughs> this was when Is did this. Do you remember? the mystery involved in new banners because it was there was a lot of things like who gets demoted and we didn't have as many data miners then like it was really hard to get information on that do, do you remember that time i just remember that there were specific instances where we could predict who would be the demo and that was at least for me one of the key features was like oh does this unit have like a valor skill because they're never demoting those <laughs> but outside of that, no, it was like a complete mystery. And people were, from what I remember, assuming that she was also going to be free akin to the likes of Arden or Black Knight because that's how we got these like freebies in the past. They weren't on banners, but they decided just to put her on her own separate banner with a color share. 
to boot. So, wow. They showed her on the Tempest Trials map. I was right there. I thought this was going to be a free unit. <laughs> now, we, we talked about it a little bit. When did you actually start playing competitively? Like, when did these things actually start mattering to you? I would say maybe around the time of Aether Raids, which was a while ago, to be fair, but... There really wasn't much to the competitive scene outside of like going for your tier 20 and we didn't even have tier 21 back then. So it was basically just stacking up stats to the point where you would want to like have like a bunch of orbs and feathers and just basically keep the loop going. So it was really until like we got like that mode that I was really getting invested into it because otherwise it was like building favorites and just messing around. It was so funny. I did a ton of research on this, and my favorite video I found was PM1 talking about how busted Takumi was mm -hmm. and marveling at the fact that his unit got so many gains when they killed another unit because they weren't leveled to level 40 in Arena yet. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> And this is like this is not to make fun of fun of PM1 at all. Like we were all there. It was oh, yeah. so confusing how all this stuff worked. <laughs> yeah, and despite like all of the new effects and everything they just throw at you now, it feels a lot more understandable for some reason. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I guess that's just more so because like we've been playing for it. Who knows how long now? As far as the ranking for this unit, I, we, we gave her a four on the botched scale. Not quite a five, but I, I do have to ask, do you feel like this was just a pure money grab or was this something they just fell into accidentally? I can't imagine they would have done it accidentally, but I'm wondering <laughs> what the motivation behind it was. I think what rubbed people more so the wrong way was that she came with a PRF and a PRF special that was like really, really good. Even though like they most people replaced her peer up with like a slang edge and like a speed refine and then give her wrath. Most people definitely remember her as that like one shot nuke. That was just really annoying to deal with. I, that's the way I remember her. I, I I remember wanting her very badly and not being able to get her. <laughs> I remember I had my plus ten Noe and she just one shot her and I was like, How? She's blue. <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> no, not Noe. <laughs> uh, but that was the dragon meta for you. Oh yeah. Alright, we're we're gonna move us on now into the wonderful world of Gen 2. This is one of my favorite units. I <laughs> So I summoned for legendary Azura early. I knew exactly what kind of unit this was. And at this point I was actually saving orbs. So I was able to plus 10 her in like three banners, which was, I was ecstatic about. Oh, wow. Oh, it was, this is still to this day, this is a unit that I use constantly. But I have to know, did you summon for legendary Azura early? I didn't, because I was on that path of just saving orbs. I, I just had to skip, unfortunately. There was definitely a divide in the community. There were the haves and the have-nots. Like this was, to me, this was the first must-have unit. And that is clearly why we have ranked this unit at five stars. But I mean, there were so many things that were designed around this unit and worked because this unit was there like rally traps that I've got shown here. Um, even like this really cracked me up because I was looking back at this and this is an old flyer ball. Like I remember even going into arena when she was there, like I could sit there, do nothing. A cap would just reach me immediately, turn one. It was like, yeah, I can see why people <laughs> wanted her and probably what I probably should have gotten for her, but I didn't get her to like way, way later. From here, I think we can move on. This is one of the more interesting controversies, Camilla Gate. Are you a Camilla fan? I was a fan. Okay, I don't want to be that guy that's like, I'm not a fan anymore because all these all so like <laughs> I, I my perception of her didn't change regardless. Sure it was a bit annoying always seeing the Fate Royals, especially Camilla, like on seasonal banners. But I was also part of that crowd that purposely tried to make her win during CYL three <laughs> just to see the reaction. Because everyone was already fed up and the last banner before CYL was the bath banner so naturally people are already really really sick of it so to me i was like let's get her another one and we haven't had one since brave i believe so uh yeah i mean i can definitely see why people were not happy with her i had no idea that you were such an agent of chaos <laughs> oh yeah this is this is me we're talking about <laughs> 
four Camillas in a year is so a many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that's, and generation one had a Camilla. And then generation three, which is just like at the very beginning of generation three, we had the brave Camilla that you voted for. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that is, that is so many in such a short amount of time. Do you feel like IS has unfairly punished Camilla because of this, though? I mean, when was the last time we had a Camilla ult? We did have her as like a back tech for Pirate Hinoka. And I don't want to be that guy that's like, no, it's not fair, because all the Camilla fans got like seven Camillas to play around with. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Most people don't even have like one all of their favorites. Yeah. So I don't feel bad. But part of me also feels bad in the sense that most of them aren't really competitively viable. So unless you just only care for PvE, you can't really use them. As far as the ranking here, we gave this four stars, which I think is about right. Like this was this was a mess. It wasn't the absolute worst they've done, but <laughs> this was a bit of a mess. All right, we were talking about the entry into Aether Raids. This is Thracer. This is such an interesting time. Now, keep in mind, Gen 3 was a little bit truncated. So both of these units are just on the outside of Gen 3. But I thought they I thought they encompassed a lot of what was going on. Now, how much did you invest into dragons in 2019 before Thracer showed up? I think the only really built dragon I had was Noe. I know I keep bringing her up, but that, that was like the one dragon I really built when the dragon meta was a thing. And I just kind of stuck around with her since. Now, you you will never, ever get hate on this channel for talking about OG Noe, because I was a huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thracer came out and I absolutely panicked trying to get some way for her to be viable in Astra Seas. I couldn't. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't working. But and this was this was a unit that we talked about. It was more than just dragons though. Like this was the this was a really powerful defense mythic. I think because of the way her weapon works, she actually took out Altina as well. Yep. So like I had people tell me like the best thing you had to do was run deflect magic. But I also found that really weird when you have a res based mythic that I need to supplement it with a deflect seal, so a green unit doesn't beat my red unit. <laughs> and I'll admit, Altina definitely aged a lot better nowadays because we've had way more units that take advantage of damage reduction and damage reduction skills, but also the likes of Winter Burn and Dida, making it easier for her to enter the vantage range. So in that regard, I do think Altina is way better now than she's ever been. Now, the, the reason this is so relevant right now is because we are going through a dragon renaissance. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like this is going to follow that same pattern where Thracer came in and just destroyed the dragon meta? Do you think we're going to get that same fell swoop that just takes them all out? It might be possible that one day, when Perseer gets her remix and refine, that we'll probably see some more of like a dragon, like less dragon presence in Astra. But given how many options we have for carries now, there's a good shot that it won't affect as much in Aether Raids, but may affect stuff more in like summoner duels, depending on how they treat her. The Shadow, do you realize what you just said? No. What you just said was that it was possible that the same extinction for dragons happens with the exact same unit. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I can see that for sure. <laughs> that, that would be so mean. <laughs> yeah, return the four, man. <laughs> um, as far as power goes, I, I think this was a three. Again, we're both Noe fans, yeah. so this was very near and dear to our hearts. But this wasn't the absolute most busted thing on the planet. Still, it's, it, it took an entire segment of units and just negated them, which was just not fun at all. Oh, for sure. I do want to head over to Altina, and I wanted this I wanted this to be a little bit of a bigger discussion because this was so interesting that we had units that had these weird roles. Um, I think of Sothis with the the fact, even now, even with her refine, she looks like a carry, but she's a defense mythic. 
Um, and, and same thing with Altina. She really looked like someone you built your team around. And that's very hard to do on Aether Raids when you don't have the extra HP and the extra stats. Um, similar thing with Naga. But do you think we'll ever have a good hybrid unit like this that has staying power? I'm under the belief that if you're going to go into a hybrid role, the roles in question that you can perform have to be significant enough to where they can be carried by themselves. I guess, for example, would be a Versa. And I wasn't very keen on her refund, mainly because even though she has like her whole sudden panic gimmick with debuffs, which is cool, she also has a plug-in effect. But that also means she has to kind of divide her supportive capabilities with sudden panic for her offensive presence, but it also didn't help Billy. She's a range flyer, and range flyers don't really have anything. <laughs> but I think one of the better units that really were able to shine in a hybrid nature was Summer Thor. Not only because her supportive capabilities are like really, really good, you know, World Breaker, Exposure, and Saul, but because she can charge her own specials over time, she can just blast the unit with AoEs. So in that regard, I find that your hybrid nature has to be coveted enough to the point where it's worthwhile regardless of which role you go into. That is such a good point. I really should have invested in the Thoki. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I was like, I need that. I need that immediately. <laughs> it's weird for like the other mythics that you have on screen because I don't really know what they were trying to do with Sothis in general or if it was just one of those, well, we don't want to really do anything with her, so we'll just pretend that we are doing something with her. Here's an old Disrupt and the damage reduction. I don't really recall any sort of like fire sweep threats really being that prevalent on Aetherade's offense. I, I don't really see what role she fills on Aetherade's defense, unfortunately. She is utterly confusing. Now, as far as the botched rating for Altina, we gave her about a two. At the point of this unit's release, she expired so, so quickly. But I want us to move into Gen 4 here because things start to get very interesting. We're gonna talk about Mila. The question I wanna lead into is, how do you feel about supportive mythics in general? I find that they're the stronger of the two mythics because you're not really competing for a combative role otherwise. Support is always gonna be necessary. So if you have to, if you're required to bring a mythic regardless and, the, and they're supportive, then it feels like you're not really giving up anything in the long run as opposed to bringing like Reagan, for example, and Reagan's probably not the best example, but she's definitely combat heavy. So if you were to bring like a Mila compared to like a Reagan, Mila's going to be performing a lot more supportively in nature than Reagan. That brings us to an interesting time in Arena. <laughs> oh boy. I'm just going to hop right to our rating. We only gave this unit one star uh, just because this wasn't this wasn't particularly mishandled or just terrible of IS, but oftentimes it does feel like their grail units they gave or they give us are a little underpowered. If you look at the time when this unit came out, because I was trying, we talked about this unit and I remembered being so annoyed with this unit and so did you, but the, mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out why that was. And right at the time when this unit released was when we started to get all of the ranged legendary units, like the really powerful ones like Legendary Krom. And it just, you have a one movement unit going up against a calf like, like Legendary Leaf, and it is just tough to maneuver. Oh yeah, it, it was definitely a pain if you didn't have like Armor March, but I don't even remember if that even scored well, so it probably wasn't even an option back then. So obviously we've seen a rise in armors just because of save skills. Do you feel they'll fade the same way that this batch of armors did? It's hard to say because I don't think we've ever had a meta that was so highly dependent on a particular skill or movement type. Like we do have erosion in summoner duels, which just negates saves outright. I don't know if they're ever really going to phase out armors per se, or they're going to bring about more infantry style tanks like we've just gotten with the likes of brave dimitri and his refine yeah asker i feel like they're gonna make it so you have alternatives other than just like using one strategy so that way you can also prepare for those types of strategies too because if they keep littering the game with like armor effective weaponry or like dragon effective weaponry <laughs> depending on like the armor then i can easily see saves not being as effective but also bringing about more infantry style tanks but given the fact that we also have like Dead Eye Lethality, 
You're not really doing that unless you have like true damage reduction, which three units have. I don't know about you, but I miss my infantry omni tanks. So I'm I'm hoping they come back. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. I don't think I actually built like a big omni tank. I've always been on like the vantage hype train since like 2020. Yes, my man. <laughs> <laughs> I am a huge Vantage fan. Oh, it's fun. Which is actually a good strategy against this next person. The unit that blew up everything. Oh, yeah. I have to ask, where were you the first time you saw Elder V's video on how to construct a Sigurd line? <laughs> I could not tell you. This unit just absolutely wrecked me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's brutal. Now, I, I do have to ask a question here. This is something that I've always wondered. I Most of the things that IS does, I, I, I know we talk bad about them a lot. I do think that they most of the stuff they do is very thought out. This is the one unit that I saw where I, I honestly don't think they knew what they were doing. Like, I, didn't, I don't think they knew the impact this would have on Aether Raids. I was wondering what your take on that was, though. Considering they pretty much like hot fixed him with a safety fence like a week later. I don't think they really knew either. And this was like, I knew especially because they did this right before the like monthly update that we usually get. This was like, oh yeah, we'll do this. We announced it before. So don't quit. Still play the game. Here's safety fence. But I think, I think the issue was less about his combat. And it was more about that special because if he got that special off, which was, he was pretty much always able to do because you could just run quick and balls. Yeah. Then every ally got extra movement, which I think was the bigger issue more so than like he hits hard. You oh, one hundred percent. Him hitting hard helped a lot, but that that special was just nuts. <laughs> yeah, no, I was not having any of that. Like, if you, I wasn't at the at the time that this came out. I wasn't a big believer in saves. I, I just didn't think they were needed. I had other things that I was taking care of stuff with. I just, I didn't really care. This unit came out and I had to convert. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> I, there was just no way that I could take care of. Well, look at this map. This is completely open. As soon as he procs that special, like all of those calves are just going to be able to wreak havoc on you. And there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> yeah, no, it's brutal. So um, saves were pretty much mandatory, but I also... Were saves before... No, saves had to have been before Legendary Sigurd. Just before. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was also when they were, like, first taken off. So, like, the impact didn't really, like, come about until, like... They basically made it so you either have save or you're gonna have a really hard time. Oh, yeah. For sure. <laughs> but speaking of this time, this was interesting to me. I, we talked about what was botched in Gen 5, and, and we both agreed that just... The unit rollout was just dizzying. <laughs> yeah, is, no, it was brutal. Is this the most power creep we have ever seen in a single year? I'm almost tempted to say the gen we're in right now might, but Gen 5 was like really, really bad on that front because, yeah, no, we had Mythic Dancers, which basically made it imperative for scoring and all that jazz. Ninja Lane, who Gale Force with Slang Dagger, <laughs> which really, really dumb. You had Legendary Claude, who was basically one of the safest initiators in the game. And then you had, you know, I, I just keep going on. Like, there were yeah. so many threats. I think I mentioned this. We gave this five stars. Like, there's no question. Like, this was oh, this yeah. was nuts. Absolutely nuts. But I did want to hop over into Gen 6 and talk a little bit about what happened in this last generation that we just got through. There's no question about this unit here. I, one of its part of this is just recency bias in general because we are we are so familiar with Duochrom and we don't know how his end writes itself. But this is one thing I will ask: Are we doomed to always have crazy Februaries? <laughs> you know, I can believe it since the past two years have been pretty meta-defining. Like out of all the banners we've gotten in the past two years, it's always been in February. I can easily see, like, the next February being like, oh, now we have, like, save fours that score 500 SP and proc within four spaces or, so, or some, like, crazy crap like that. But Dual Chrom was, like, the unit. Because, like, everyone already found, like, Legendary Chrom to be scary. But I personally found that, like, 
after a certain while with like no follow-up effects and like all that stuff coming out, especially damage reduction effects, it felt really, really difficult to use him then because he only had like the one follow-up. Even if he were like speed stacking, if you just had a faster unit, then it would be difficult for him to just outright one shot at that point. So when you release a unit that can not only charge a dead eye like immediately, and then also have <laughs> all the same stuff that made legendary Krom scary with a guaranteed follow up to boot, I can see why he's very meta defining because armor effectiveness with that high of an attack set and all the things he can do is really really ridiculous. So we gave this unit four stars, and please understand the reason this unit is four stars is because. Even though this is a an excellent unit and has put so many good pieces together, uh, a lot of these other units were five stars because they were so original. Like it was something brand new that came in that just absolutely busted the game. <laughs> He's just another iteration, but a very, very good one. <laughs> I can agree with that, yeah. How long do you think it's going to be until we stop seeing this unit? I think if we were to get more effects akin to like Brave Tiki, where she could just disable like specials right out of the gate during combat, I can see him falling off. But I don't know if they necessarily want to take away her niche just like that. Unless they were to like make it pulse smoke four, which I can see happening. Oh, God. If that became common enough, I can see Duochrome falling off. I find that even if we do get something akin to the Brave Tiki effect, as a C skill or like any other passive. To change fate is still a really, really good support skill because you get the free repo, but you can also charge an ally's special. Yes. So even if we were to lose out on that, you could still run like one cooldown lethality on like a Yuri, for example, repo them in, and basically trigger lethality on the second hit, which would bypass stuff like Hardy Fighter. So in that regard, I do think even if he were to fall off in particular, he could still see usage because of that timed pulse effect. That leads us over into another interesting topic. With all of these preference weapons, I wanted to talk about Nimi. And this was actually your suggestion to put her up there because this was such an interesting situation with her getting a, a uh, an inheritable colorless tome that no one wanted. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, that was something else, dude. <laughs> I find that in particular, Nimi was like, Probably the worst, like, handled unit ever. And I know we always get units wow. that are like, oh, my favorite has, like, a... No, they have an inheritable, and it's like, oh, they're a five-star lock, and they're generic, blah, 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 blah. That sucks. Obviously. Like, I, I know that feeling. But when you give me a unit that has no access to other inheritables, and they're locked with their inheritable weapon, by the way, because... <laughs> There are no other inheritable colorless tomes, and you can't give her anything else because all the tomes are color coded. I would easily say Nimi was one of the worst botched units in the game. Even though she's like cool for fodder, in terms of just like she's a generic tome who basically can mimic all the other units that run vulture tomes, but she has no other options. So even if I were to run like a Salem, for example, I could give them Unity Blooms or I could give them Bridal Orchid. She's stuck with Vulture. <laughs> so it's, I mean, essentially it is a preference tome. <laughs> I guess in some aspects, sure, yeah, it is. But wow, like if they were going to make it a preference tome, they could have thrown on like one more effect. You know what I mean? The rating on this unit was four. And for all the reasons you said. <laughs> mm -hmm. But moving on, and there's obviously less data on that on Gen 7. We essentially have the Braves. <laughs> I think it is always interesting to me to see what they put on the Braves because you get a little picture of what they're playing with. I do have to ask at this point, who's your favorite Brave unit now that you've been able to play with them a little bit? I've been saying this since like we got the news of like everything. That Selif was the best one of the four. And I still hold to that because even outside of like the no follow-up and the extra movement, his combat's probably one of the safest in the game. Not only because he has a speed stat, meaning that he could also avoid stuff like stall, but he has Miracle. So he could always initiate combat without any sort of worry. Outside of like niche units, like units with dual phase break because they can attack twice regardless, 
You're going to be struggling against him in general. Oh, definitely. I, I've struggled against him. Oh, yeah. He, he could be annoying. But in terms of just overall fun, I found that Krom was probably the most fun. And I know it's like, oh, you can still fall in Sara. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's funny. But like, is it viable? Not really. But I'm hoping right now, or not right now, I'm hoping in the future we'll get more types of visible buff effects that he can steal that can't necessarily be applied via just existing, like Resonance Shield Blades. Because I think that's one of the things kind of holding Krom back, in my opinion, is that he just feels like Brave Erica with extra steps for a way lower floor, but a potentially higher ceiling that you may not even see. I 100% agree with that. If you look at our rating here, we gave him one star, which is really hard to do because most of the units we've looked at, we had time to see how they aged and actually how busted they were. I think this is probably going to be about right for this unit. My next question is, six months from now, is this still the premier melee damage dealer? Unless they were to just outright copy Chase's weapon and then add extra effects, that he may stand the test of time for a while. I know that may be like hard to say because we just got him. Yeah. But the miracle effect is really, really good, especially if you are looking to enter combat, which is why units like Ascended Celica are that annoying to deal with on Aetherade's defense because she can initiate on you no matter what and you can't kill her. Now, I do think this probably will stand the time as the most botched unit of Gen 7 just because of the massive amounts of controversy that Brave Tiki brought in. We gave her three stars here, which I think is about right. I want to ask, do you feel like all of the hubbub was warranted for this unit. Obviously, we're, we're taking out the absolute extremists who messaged the the artist. That was yeah, just, yeah. That, that was a bad look. <laughs> that was too much. That was too much. That's obviously too much. But other than that. It, it's interesting because CYO isn't like a stranger to just using like gener- like their father's or mother's like garb. So like even if you see self, he's using his like dad's wardrobe. We had Brave Ike with his... So then, but you could see it throughout like each CYO. We've always had units like that. We even had Brave Erica dress up as Ephraim. Yeah. To say, if you were to tell me that adult Tiki would be dressing up as your younger self, I don't think I would have been surprised. But I find it specifically hilarious. And I know that's probably not the word people want to hear. <laughs> Mainly because everyone was advocating for a new adult Tiki all for five years. They were like, okay, let's all band together, put her in first place. And they're like, yeah, that'll teach you intelligent systems. They come back. <laughs> Here's adult young Tiki. And I can understand why people weren't keen with this outfit. But at the same time, it's like, it, it's hilarious. It's really hilarious. But also you got a brand new unit with good skills. It's like, do you really want anything else? It's hilariously unfortunate because I, I feel like IS was trying to strike a balance by making the adult Tiki fans happy with the unit and also appealing to their Japanese crowd that is very, very big into Young Tiki. And Mm -hmm. I I, I don't know how the Japanese crowd actually feels about this unit. I would love to, I would love to get that perspective, but- I'm sure somebody will tell us. (laughs) In the comments, leave it there. We would love to hear it. But I know over in the West here, we have not been as big of a fan of this art. (laughs) So- Yeah, to say the least. (laughs) But I I think you're right. I think folks should be happy with this. I really do believe that we are going to see the rise of the Omni tank with all of the weird and heritable things we're getting. And with the way the meta works, where we are not really about threat range, I think it's becoming easier to have that. And I think this unit could age very well. And for all the Tiki fans, I'm hoping for you. But (laughs) I'm sure she'll age well over time. I, I can see it. All right. You've heard a guarantee from the man who has done more highlight videos than I have ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> okay. We've gone over every generation. I wanted to talk a little bit about numbers. I really like to dig into how the game has looked over time. It's interesting. Some of this is probably recency bias. But is there any question that Gen 5 was the most controversial gen of all of these? I could easily see it being the most controversial. We definitely had our moments in Gen 1 and Gen 2, but I think in terms of like really, really big power creep, we're still seeing a lot of these units even to this day. The thing that feels different to me is that if you look at Gen 1, it looks like things that they did on accident. (laughs) 
could see Reinhardt being an accident. I don't see Ira being an accident. I'm sorry. Um, I, accident maybe is a bad word. If you look at the way they did it, I don't think they expected it to be as poorly received. <laughs> okay, that, yeah. Okay, I can agree with that. <laughs> I feel like Gen 5... I mean, a lot of it I feel like was done on purpose, especially the rollout of all the new units. Obviously, I talked about Legendary Sigurd, and I don't, and we talked about the fence. But as far as the botched portion of that, it really feels like this was something that they they were actually drumming up controversy to see how it went. They really loaded a lot on us during that generation, and I can assume that like a lot of people were getting fed up with it. The last piece I really want to look at this is Gen 7. Where do you think the final ranking for Gen 7 is going to hit as far as the value for the total controversy? I can see it at least going up to 7 or 8 because usually they pick up, like, they roll out a lot more power creep and a lot more stuff around the end of the year, beginning of January, up until the next CYL or Hero Rises because of recency bias and they want everyone voting for those units. But even with that being the case, they always increase the power level after CYL. So I can see it going from like a spike in December and maybe dwindling down a bit in January and then like plateauing in like anywhere between like March and May and then going back up again. This has been an interesting activity going through and digging into this, but I, I wanted to talk about the effect of controversy on the game. And this this is even more numbery. Um, I have to give a quick shout out, shout out. This is all data from a user named Flare Blitz. They post regularly in Reddit, and I will I will put a link down below. And he was so kind and gave me his numbers for the sales on the individual banners. And there is a really interesting way that he calculates that and weights that. Just know that this is, at a bare minimum, a very thought out scale, and I think a very good one. The other thing you wanna remember is, on the left, that is a ranking. So the better value is the higher value as far as how much money IS is making on these. And I mean, is this any surprise that the more broken units usually come with them a higher a higher uh, uh, gross? I don't think it's really that big of a surprise. But also, there are some instances where I do believe maybe people don't really pick up on the power level until they see it in action. Because I know one of the more slept on banners from recent history was the Yuri banner. Oh, and I know a lot yeah. of people didn't like really pull on that. But I also remember seeing Yuri, Kanto 2, slaying infantry. I was like, yeah, this unit has it all. And he's going to dominate. And people didn't really pick up on that. Until every until all like the big meta players were using. At which point we just got like seven banners with him. He got we got him for free. We got so many things. Well, I feel like we have an example of that on this chart. I mean, looking at Mila and how impactful she was, and if you look at that, that's a bit of a downslope right there. People didn't really respect Mila until a little bit later, uh, just because it was it was something so new. Isolation was weird. Um, Yuri was the case where, I mean, he was really good, but then Summoner Duels came out and he was amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we've got the same chart. We've got an overlay here, and you, you can see I've done something crazy and gone to two axes. And what I wanted to look at is, obviously we see that better units, higher gross. Like, you, you get more money when you release more powerful units. This is really interesting to me that this is player participation based on the number of folks who played at least one match in Tempest Trials, which is a pretty good measure because of how many orbs we get out of that. But to look at this and say that when these big units pop in, the participation goes up, which is nuts. Um, obviously, we don't have good data from Mila there. If you look at the flat line over to the left, that is an area where I just don't have Tempest Trial participation data. But this is mm -hmm. this is crazy. Um, I do have to give a quick shout out to uh, to Prodigy. Um, Prodigy sixty four has helped me with math in Faye so much. Like I'm not even joking. Um, I, I thank you so much, and thank you for doing all of this number crunching and actually letting me use it. 
this is something that they do for fun and they are very smart and I appreciate them a lot. But how do you feel about this? Like this is this is basically saying that it's good for the game to do crazy stuff. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. Like I talked about this before we started recording. Um, any press, like there's a saying as to why like all publicity is good publicity and a lot of it tends to come from controversy. So like we, we were talking about like Pokemon Sword and Shield a bit. Um, it got a lot of hate up till launch, but constant, constant coverage from everybody, even the people who are just hating it. But that in turn gave it a lot of eyes on it. So in that aspect, even though it's not like directly comparable, I find that having something people talk about constantly is going to be a means of having that perform a lot better. Because the word, if you want something to not do well, you just let it fade into obscurity. But with a constant controversy, you're more than likely always going to have it on the mind. You're going to have it. You're going to remember it. Like even to this day, like I still remember like, the Ira Gate stuff, or like even Reinhardt being as crazy it was because it was bad. But I don't remember stuff like Legendary Ryoma, or you, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, exactly. It's like it, controversy sucks, and I think that I think they know that to an extent. But I also think they're not doing it to like a crazy point where it's just unplayable. It's interesting because we complain about it a lot. <laughs> yep. And that gets the drums rolling. Or oh, yeah. Or whatever, or whatever the saying is. I, I know I butchered that. <laughs> <laughs> this was the most interesting thing for me. And this, this is something that I, I wondered about. But I, I honestly expected it to at least, like, maybe plateau or something. I didn't expect the spikes. Like, particularly, you look at that uh, dual crom. Like, he releases, and there is a huge spike. Yeah. I do have to have a disclaimer here because uh, uh, folks will, will call me out on this. Understand that this does not necessarily mean that these correlate exactly. There are a lot of things going on in the game. It's just interesting that every time one of these units pops up, and we only really have three data points here, that every time one of them pop up, we get a spike. It's really interesting to me. Um, is there any other final thoughts you have on controversy in the game before I let you go? I would like to give it credit. The Valentine's Times Banner was Awakening themed. And Awakening <laughs> is popular. And it had like some of the most popular Awakening characters on the banner. So I think that helped a bit too. But I also think part of it also would have been like if they were all generic with like really mediocre stat lines and imperatives, I don't think it would have been as good. But... I think, I think it goes in tandem with each other. Summoners, let us know in the comments how valid you think this is to look at it this way. I always love the discussion. I'm not even kidding. I post it down below. We'll talk about it. Uh, Zashadow, thank you so much for being on. I, I had an absolute blast discussing this. Yeah, man, anytime. Just so you guys know, I, I'm not even going to plug your latest video because by the time this posts, you'll have done six more. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good though. Like seriously, go check out this guy's channel. You probably already have. Um, I will say any chance you get to support your community, do it. Um, so I, Zashadow, do you have, you have super thanks on, correct? Actually, no, I think I turned it off. I figured it, was, it wasn't really worth turning on, but um, I mean, just going to the channel or even looking at a video too is, definitely more than enough you can also join the discord server which you probably will plug but that's fine i'm trying to hit 2,000 members I will, um i will put the link to the discord server because it is such a fun place to be go turn on super thanks and guys i i'm i'm not even kidding like there is so much work that goes into this i swear the shadow does not sleep like it, it is the moment a unit is out there is somehow five minutes later a highlight video <laughs> I, tr I try to manage my time well enough but also I, I, I it, it goes it, it's weird depending on the day like I'll wake up <laughs> oh boy it's reset and it's like four o'clock it's like I'm gonna sleep for 20 hours but it, it just depends I, I, I try to I try to be on top of it. Summoners, don't listen to him at all. He doesn't sleep. Like, that's a total lie. <laughs> 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 anyway, thank you again for coming on. I, I, thank you guys so much for listening. Take care and schedule an appointment with your fail just real soon.